Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John. It's the, near the very beginning of the Gospel of John. It's chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. The word of God for us, the people of God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you in all ways, for you are our rock and our ever-present Redeemer. Amen. So the, the funeral service yesterday and meeting a lot of people from, from Carrollton uh, historically, members who were here historically, uh, brought me back to my days. Most of you know that in the 60s and 70s, I was, came here uh, as a kid and was in Sunday school here. And it was terrific. We talked about, we named names. We talked about the rooms and the Sunday school program. And, and you know that that was a real big formative thing for me. I mean, being here, uh, great Sunday school program. And then I left and was in, in St. Luke's for 40 years where I eventually taught Sunday school. And that's what got me to, to, to get to seminary. I was, I, I was impressed by the choir here. I got in the choir at St. Luke's and all of that it, one day it all came clear, we're going to seminary. Now, when I was in seminary, uh, it was a little bit intimidating at age, whatever it was, 42 or 43, um, and I sort of girded my loins, and I had a list of seminary terms, the kind of terms which can be kind of alienating in church, but were really intimidating to me as a seminary student because I didn't know these when I arrived at Duke Divinity. So when I get there and they'd start to say these words, I'd keep this glossary handy and I would add new words as they would come up or I would, and then I would refer to this when the words came up again if I needed a little bit of a refresher on those. So here's some of that terminology. Apologetics. It's the story of my life, apologizing. Um, no, it's not about that. It is, that's the rational defense of Christianity exegetical theology or undertaking an exegesis. This is the critical study of Scripture in order to come up with the true meaning and intent of the Scripture. Hermeneutics, not the monsters. It's the science and art of interpretation of the Bible, so you can do that exegesis thing. Soteriology, who knows that one? The study of salvation. Eschatology, the study of the end times. And then there's the word Christology, the branch of Christian theology which deals with the question of the person and the nature and the role of Jesus Christ. If someone asks you, what is your Christology, they're asking you, what do you think about the role that Jesus Christ played in his life and death? So I ask you this, how do you perceive the role of Jesus? What is your Christology? And a lot of what we conceive about Jesus begins with the concept that Jesus is all God and all human the incarnation, as we call it. Now, I don't think, though, that without this scripture we just read from John, that we would have much of a philosophy of the incarnation, you know, Jesus becoming man. Because the idea of Jesus revealing himself or God revealing himself through a human is, is kind of radical. But John explains it. And I love the way that C.S. Lewis explained it. He said this. He says, all right, picture this. Lying at your feet is a dog. Imagine for the moment that your dog and every other dog is in deep distress. Some of us love dogs very much. If it would help all the dogs in the world to become like men, would you be willing to become a dog? The poor substitute of looking into the beloved's face and wagging your tail, unable to smile or speak. But yet J Jesus did that for us. 
Our inclination is often to think of God as being distant and so far away, far removed from the intricate details of this creation that he made. But the reality of the incarnation, as we just saw in John, it's a much different concept. It's Jesus coming down, God coming down to dwell with us. Now, one of the early church fathers we studied in seminary was St. Athanasius, also called Athanasius, Athanasius the first of Alexandria, not Alexandria, Louisiana. And uh, he was a third century theologian, uh, and he was an apologist. So he was a defender of the church. He was also a pope in Alexandria. And one author said about uh, Athanasius, he says, he must have had these words from the scripture today that we read from John resonating in his mind when he wrote his classic work on the incarnation of the word because Athanasius gives the most profound and concise explanation of the incarnation when he says, God became what we are so that we might become what he is. That's a pretty simple explanation of a, uh, the notion of theosis. That's another one of the seminary words. It's the process by which we become like God because by way of a union with God. Through that union, we can love what God loves. We begin to have the character of God. Our values and God's values merge. Our opinions are God's opinions. Jesus shows us what it is like to be a human perfectly united with God, living with God in an unbroken broken bond of intimacy that inevitably produces a lifestyle of radical deference to God. And isn't that what we're all looking for? When we surrender ourselves to Christ, we unify ourselves with Jesus, we also become incarnations. I contend that this is what is being discussed in 2 Peter, the book of the Bible in the New Testament, where we're encouraged to participate in the divine nature. This scripture reads, and this is from a perspective of one of the disciples, it says, everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the very one who invited us to God, talking about Jesus. And he says, the best invitation we, talking about the disciples, ever received. It's amazing. He says, we, the disciples, were also given absolutely terrific promises to pass on to everyone else. Your tickets, get this, to participation in the life of God after you turn away from a life corrupted by evil. How can that be? How can we possibly merit that kind of opportunity to participate in the life of God. Well, we don't merit it. But I want you to think about one of the verses we read from our, our scripture this morning, verse 16, which says this, out of Jesus' fullness we have received grace in place of grace already given. This has been described by some people as like grace on grace on grace. It's God giving freely, his nature to give freely to us whether or not we deserve it because we are sinners. Wow, that's a great gift, but what do we do with that grace? The answer is also given in today's scripture. A lot in that scripture today we read from John. Did you catch it in verses 12 and 13? John says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of will of the flesh, nor of will of man, but they were born of God. When you were born of God, he's not talking about the first birth from the womb, but the second birth, what we call being born again. It's a work purely of free grace from God, but correspondingly, it's a product of your free will to decide. It is then that you become a child of God. That happens consciously by establishing your own faith in Jesus. And that's critical because a lot of people say, in fact, we're going to say it in connection with communion in a few minutes, things to the effect of, well, we are all God's children. And that's not exactly what Jesus taught. It's not automatic. You have to consciously opt in to being a child of God. And here's a point of that wonderfully given grace. 
which here again, you have to choose to receive. And it's this, when you have this grace and you accept it, then you can recognize truth. We all know the concept of truth. We say sometimes it's staring somebody right in the face and they either ignore it or they don't understand it or comprehend it. But as we've mentioned several times, truth is not an abstract concept or some philosophical thing out there, but it is instead a person, and it's the person of Jesus. The scripture today says it. It means that when you've seen Jesus, you have seen the truth. The question is then, do you recognize Jesus as truth. Now, lest there be any uh, debate about this, that Jesus is truth, that's exactly what he says in scripture he is. He says in John 14, he says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And in John 12, he says, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. Recognizing Jesus as truth is, uh, I don't know, like a chicken and egg thing or maybe a catch-22 or cart before the horse. I don't know, one of those circumstances, but it's like this. If you are rejecting God's grace, that is, you don't have faith, you refuse to have faith in Jesus, you will not recognize Jesus as truth. Because let's face it, if in fact you were recognizing Jesus as truth, then you would accept God's grace and you would be a person of faith. I contend that too many of us believe that faith is going to finally come for us after we have been walloped upside the head by Jesus in some manner, rather than believing in the scriptures and then studying Jesus to learn the truth. Instead, what happens is we get walloped by life, at which point it's no wonder we have a hard time becoming people of faith. The faith has to come first. Give Jesus the benefit of the doubt, because if you don't start there, you're probably never going to start. Do what the 12th and 13th verses in today's scripture said to do. Receive Jesus, believe in his name, at which point truth then opens up to you and becomes apparent to you. It's when that truth opens up to you that you can begin to be made like God in character that you can begin to love the things that God loves, that you can have God's values be your values, that you can have God's opinions become your opinions, and you become an incarnation. Jesus became what we are so that we might become what he is. If we never get to the point of becoming what he is, then there was really no point of him becoming what we are are. Let us pray. Jesus, you told us you are the way, the truth, and the life. You came to show us the way, the truth, and what our life should be, Lord. Help us to embrace that in all facets, all facets of your life, Christ. We need that truth in our lives. Help us to recognize you as true, and when we do, Lord, we will have no response available other than to Acknowledge your supremacy, your lordship over all of us, and accept you into our hearts and have faith in you so that we can bring that faith out into a world that needs it so badly. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.